thank you, Dean Charney, and welcome to our graduates and their families and friends on this momentous day. You should be very proud of yourselves, and we wish you all tremendous success in your diverse career journeys in public health and healthcare leadership, in biomedical and clinical research and informatics, and genetic counseling. And remember, wherever your careers take you, you will always be part of the Mount Sinai family. Today's graduates come from all walks of life. Just as you represent many different career paths, you are also a very diverse group in terms of racial, ethnic, gender, and cultural backgrounds. And today, I'd like to offer some thoughts about that diversity. We know that diversity is essential in order for us to tackle the problems, the challenges of our time. Alzheimer's disease, drug addiction, autism, just to name a few. Empirical research has shown again and again that a diverse group of people with different backgrounds, viewpoints, and perspectives can tackle complex problems with far greater innovation and creativity. However, despite considerable effort and continuing discussion of diversity over several decades now in the biomedical community, we haven't made nearly enough progress. We continue to struggle with the recruitment and retention of women, people from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, people with disabilities, and those from different cultural and economically disadvantaged backgrounds. It is a systemic issue in our community and requires what I like to call affirmative attention, a constant effort to truly achieve equal opportunity. The gender gap in the sciences is less of a pipeline issue than a retention issue. For example, the number of women pursuing PhDs in biomedical sciences in the United States has increased dramatically over the past decade, now representing 60% of admitted first-year students this year. That's the good news. Yet the proportion of female faculty nationwide hovers around 30%, with a much lower number at the senior ranks. So we must ask ourselves why women scientists, on average, do not advance at the same rate as men to the higher level of university faculty and administration. When it comes to racial diversity, the challenges are greater because we struggle with both attracting new scientists and healthcare professionals of diverse backgrounds, as well as retaining them as their careers progress. Recent national surveys have confirmed what we know, and that is that the number of individuals underrepresented in science and medicine who join the field remain stubbornly low, and that the faculty at US-based universities and medical schools remain overwhelmingly white. So we need to do more, and we need to figure out how to do more, more effectively to address this limited pipeline as well as retention issues similar to those seen for women. In my several roles at Mount Sinai and through service on a number of national committees, I've had the opportunity to speak with people from many backgrounds, and it has become very clear to me far later in my career than I would have liked that individuals from underrepresented groups have many additional challenges to navigate. I've learned about the struggles to adjust to a new culture and a new academic institution. I've learned about the challenges to move across the country or even come to the United States from a different country to take advantage of the spectacular opportunities we offer. And I've learned in retrospect that by contrast, I was indeed very fortunate in my career as a white Jewish male growing up in New York City. I've never questioned whether I belonged. I never lacked role models or mentors. I had a wealth of opportunities throughout my career. This may, have been, this may not have been true if I were born in an earlier generation, but I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. At Mount Sinai, we are redoubling our efforts to take stock of where we are today and are committed to doing much better moving forward. We are very proud of the progress that we've made in appointing outstanding women and people underrepresented in science and medicine to many top positions in our medical center. We sponsor spectacular programs in our neighboring communities to spark interest in biomedical sciences, starting in elementary school and continuing to middle school and high school. Each summer, we sponsor many dozens of college students from around the country many from underrepresented and disadvantaged backgrounds to come to Mount Sinai to work in a lab or a clinic, and we work hard to attract as many as possible into our master's, PhD, and MD programs. 
At the same time, we are working to reduce the implicit bias that we know impairs the advancement of women and those upper rep underrepresented in science and medicine in academia. I'll just give you one example. In a 2012 study, science faculty rated identical student application materials. Half of the faculty were given materials with a female name and the other half a male name. Faculty consistently rated the male applicants as significantly more competent and hireable than the identical female applicant. And male and female scientists were equally guilty of this implicit bias. And we know that similar results have been obtained when comparing applicants with African or Hispanic sounding names. Studies such as these reveal a deep-rooted implicit bias disadvantaging women and underrepresented minorities in our nation's institutional culture. At Mount Sinai, through town hall meetings, panel discussions, workshops, training programs, and the like, we are working hard to reduce these barriers and improve the climate and succeed in retaining the best of our trainees and young faculty across diverse backgrounds. There's one more aspect of diversity to which we at Mount Sinai and our nation as a whole need to pay greater attention, and that's what I call intellectual diversity, diversity of thought and opinions. We live in polarizing times. In 2000, my family moved from Blue State, Connecticut to Red State, Texas, Dallas specifically. My 10-year-old daughter's fifth grade class voted for president. This, think back to the 2000 uh, presidential election. And she was the only one in her class of 30 students who voted for Al Gore over Texan George W. Bush. Her teacher, who was nice about it, nevertheless asked her how could she possibly vote for Gore. Meanwhile, checking the news back in our former Connecticut district, the vote was 75% Gore, 20% Ralph Nader, 5% for Bush. So what a great civics lesson that was for my children, my wife, and me in the diversity of thought in our nation. Over the past decade, we've seen far too many examples of public figures and academics being denied the right to speak, in some cases violently, at some of our nation's best colleges and universities. This is very disconcerting because free speech is one of the most important tenets of the American democracy and it is under assault today. Hearing a speech with a viewpoint with which you disagree is not suffering an act of aggression. Preventing that individual from offering a different viewpoint is an act of aggression. Now, I remember a time when people could disagree but still listen to and respect one another. After all, good people can disagree about political and cultural issues. And we must recapture that civility that allows us all to embrace our diversity of ideas because that also makes us stronger. And we need to do this both here at Mount Sinai as well as on a national scale. Lest we think that we live in unparalleled, intolerant times, it's useful to look at our nation's history. Thanks to the hit Broadway show Hamilton, we know that Alexander Hamilton, a former US Treasury Secretary, was shot and killed in a duel by Aaron Burr, who was the sitting Vice President of the United States at the time. And we think we live in tough times. So we know that despite progress, we still have a lot of work to do to create a society and culture that values what we have in common as well as what makes us all different. Celebrating that diversity, listening to one another, and challenging one another makes us all stronger and better able to work together to accomplish great things. Mount Sinai is at the vanguard of capturing this strength through diversity and demonstrating to others how we can do better. To our graduates, here's to the great things that you will do to advance medical innovation, healthcare delivery, and make us a better country. Thank you and congratulations.